Uh, one quick announcement. Uh, there's another meeting here this morning, and there's a buffet and so on. That's, that buffet is not ours, so uh, don't partake of that if you would. Uh, please follow that. That would be appreciated. Uh, get with me. Yes, I I've, I've should have talked to Steve more quickly and earlier. I blame myself. The, um, all right. Open to Acts 22, if you would. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that it is flawless, that you've preserved it for us. Give us understanding as we open it. Allow us to set aside our own opinions and preconceptions and simply believe what you have written. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We're going to start in Acts 22, verse 16. Acts 22, 16. And now, why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. To set the context, recall that what happens is this. In, in Acts 20, Paul travels to Jerusalem. And he travels to Jerusalem. He does so to bring a contribution for the poor saints at Jerusalem. There are poor saints at Jerusalem because... The program that the Lord had put in place in the prophecy program to sell everything that they had, that program was a perfectly proper program. And it contemplated the little flock, the kingdom saints, shortly entering into Daniel's 70th week. If you think about Daniel's 70th week, halfway through the week, all the believers that are in Jerusalem should flee Jerusalem to run to the mountains. Matthew 24 sets that forth. So the instruction to sell all that they have makes total sense because you're going to be leaving soon anyway. But there was a complication. What God did in the middle of the book of Acts is he took the prophetic calendar and he put it on hold. In essence, he called a timeout in the prophetic program and instituted the dispensation of grace. As a result of that decision, the saints in Jerusalem that had sold all that they had, they spent then years and years in Jerusalem after already having sold all that they have. They naturally became poor. Paul then made the conclusion correctly that the Gentiles that had been blessed through God establishing the dispensation of grace had an obligation to assist the poor saints at Jerusalem with their financial problems. That brings Paul to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20 slash 21. When Paul's in Jerusalem... What then happens is some of the Jews there conclude, they've heard, that Paul was teaching against the law. He was teaching against the people. He was teaching against Jerusalem. All of those were false accusations, but that's what they believed. As a result of that, there's a riot in Jerusalem, and they're going to tear Paul limb from limb. The Roman authorities step in to prevent that, and where we are in Acts 22, we're, we're reading through the aftermath, the trials and events that happen after Paul's been seized by the mob and then taken into Roman custody. In Acts 22, 16, we're seeing Paul's description of what happened in Acts 9. So in Acts 9, Paul is on the road to Damascus. He's blinded. He's then subsequently led into the city Ananias appears to him. So look at verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, notice, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you look at Acts chapter 9, verse 18, Acts 9, verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Ananias preaches to Paul, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. What does Paul do in response? 
he does exactly what Ananias told him to do. He arises and is baptized. What that tells you, Ananias preached the gospel of the kingdom to Paul, didn't he? In other words, the gospel of the kingdom, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16. 16. That's the exact message that Ananias preached to Paul, and Paul responded to that. Look with me, if you would, at, at Joel 2, Acts 2, Romans 10. Joel 2, Acts 2, Romans 10. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Get with me Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Look with me at verse 21. Acts 2, 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you'll notice in verse 16, but this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. So Acts 2 is quoting Joel, and it's quoting Acts 2.32 in verse 21. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at, me at Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans 10.13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's notice what's going on here. Joel 2 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2 quotes Joel 2. Paul quotes it as well. And what I would suggest to you is there is a general transdispensational principle that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What God requires under any dispensation is for man in faith to call out to him. What God then asks the man to do may differ. Noah was told to build an ark, others weren't. Leviticus tells people to offer animal sacrifices. We're not called to do that today. John the Baptist preached water baptism, but that's not something that's required of us today. So there are differences in the specific revelation, in the specific content of what God asks man to do over time. But there is an underlying unity. God always requires faith. And he always honors those who call upon him. That's consistent over time. Look with me at Romans 1.16. Romans chapter 1.16. Now we saw from Acts 22.16 that what Ananias says to Paul is, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. The gospel that was preached to Paul in Acts 9 was clearly the kingdom gospel. But that's not what Paul himself preached because the Lord gave him new revelation. Look with me at Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul himself preached the gospel of Christ. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Back to Acts 22. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. What that's referencing is in Acts 9 and verse 26, Paul goes to Jerusalem. So recall in Acts 21, the slander that's made against Paul is that Paul taught against the people, against the law, against Jerusalem. Well, in Acts 9, 26, one of the things that Paul does shortly after he's saved is he goes up to Jerusalem. And if you notice there, even while I prayed in the temple, Paul went to the temple. He wasn't uh, teaching against the law. Look at verse 18. So verse 17 says he was in a trance. Verse 18, and saw him saying unto me, make haste. And get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Paul, when he's on the road to Damascus, he has a vision of the Lord. 
He has another vision of the Lord, apparently, when he's in the temple in in Jerusalem, where the Lord says, it's time for you to leave because they're not going to receive your testimony. Notice verse 19. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on me. So Paul here is sort of arguing with the Lord a little bit. He, he, what he's saying is, the folks in Jerusalem, they know about my backstory. They know that I persecuted the body of Christ. Now get with me 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. First Timothy 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So Paul was the chief of sinners. The way that that verse is sometimes used is it's to suggest that Paul, uh, you know, sinned more Often, uh, you know, he just he, he committed a greater quantity of sins than anyone else. That's not what that verse is saying. If you think about Philippians 3, Paul says, as touching the righteousness which was in the law, he was blameless. He's the chief of sinners for the following reason. He was the leader of the sinful persecution of the kingdom church. In other words, he was in in charge of it, right? Remember how he goes to the chief priests and gets letters? The reason he's in Damascus is he has such anger against the kingdom church that he's persecuting them, not just in Jerusalem, but he's searching them out and persecuting them in other locations. So what Paul's saying, go back to Acts 22, When he's saying in verse 19 that he imprisoned and beaten every synagogue them that believed on thee, what he's essentially saying is this. Look, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the chief adversary of the kingdom church. So when I have something positive to say about the kingdom church, I have credibility. That's that's really what he's saying. They'll listen to me. Look at verse 20. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed... I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. In other words, he was, he was well known, Paul was, he was well known and visibly recognized for persecuting the body of Christ. So what Paul's saying is, I'm going to have a platform. They're going to at least listen to me, what I now have to say about Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21. And he said unto me, depart. For I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. What is the Lord saying in verse 21? Paul, it's not going to make a difference. That's what he's saying, right? In other words, yes, you think that they should listen to you, but I'm just telling you they're not going to. That's what's happening in verse 21. Now notice this carefully then. Notice it says, the verse says, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Get with me Acts chapter 26. Now, as we've gone through the book of Acts, we saw earlier in Acts 13 that the Lord opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. But what I want you to notice is that as early as Acts 9, the Lord tells Paul that he's going to be sent unto the Gentiles. Look at Acts 26 Verse 15, and I said, who art thou, Lord? So this is Paul quoting or Paul reciting what actually happened in Acts 9. And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people. Now notice carefully, and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. What that verse demonstrates is in Acts 9. In fact, even when Paul's on the road to Damascus, does the Lord tell him that he's going to have a Gentile ministry? He clearly does. Contrast that with what the Lord 
tells the 12 apostles. Recall Matthew 10? The Lord specifically tells them, go not into the way of the Gentiles. The Lord saves Paul. Acts 9, when he saves him, hadn't even entered Damascus yet, the Lord tells him, I'm going to send you unto the Gentiles. So look at Acts 22, verse 22. And I, you, you got to just love the precision of the Bible. Look at verse 22. And they gave him audience. Notice what it says. Unto this word. What's the this word? Well, in other words, they listened to everything he had to say. And then he got to verse 21. And he said, the Lord told me that I was sent unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. In other words, what he said in verse 21 was so offensive, they decided he should be killed. What that tells you is the middle wall of partition that exists in time past a real wall it's a pretty real wall right in acts 22 what happens is paul tells the whole story they listen to all of it it's at the moment when he says the lord sent me unto the gentiles and they lose their minds that's what is telling you what happened there was a very real middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. When Paul, a Jew, a Pharisee, stands up and said, the Lord sent me unto the Gentiles, it's heresy that's just unthinkable. That's what's going on in, in, in verse 22. So they think he should be put away from the earth. It's not fit that he should live. Verse 23 now notice this, and this tells you a lot about human nature. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. Because yes, if someone says that they should preach unto the Gentiles, the rational thing is to take off your clothes and throw dust in the air. Right? Because that just makes perfect sense. Man thinks that man is sophisticated and intellectual and refined and he's not is he now i know evolution is not true evolution is nonsense okay but does man often act like beasts yes he does so paul's just sitting there he makes a statement people lose their minds take off their clothes if that helps anything and then you know let's throw dust in the air because you know of course well that's verse 23 Verse 24, what verse 23 is really an example of is, is anger causes people to react emotionally and not logically. I can't remember if it was Thomas Jefferson. I think it was Jefferson where he, one of his sayings was, if you're angry, count to 10 before responding. If you're very angry, count to a hundred. Then the point was simply what? When you're angry, you're irrational. And the wisest thing to do is to just take some time and calm down, get over the sort of emotional rush so that you don't say something that's foolish. Well, the, obviously the crowd here is acting very foolishly. Verse 24. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. More insanity. So what is scourging? It's being whipped. So what happens here is the chief captain witnesses this uproar and says, okay, let's Grab Paul, let's take him into the castle. And what we should do is we should beat him until we figure out what's going on. You've probably heard this joke before, but one of the sayings about employee uh, satisfaction or contentment is the beatings will continue until morale improves. 
right? It's obviously unjust and irrational and just fundamentally unfair. Paul's there. The crowd loses their minds. The chief captain says, look, we're just going to beat this guy until he tells us what's going on. That doesn't seem right, does it? I mean, I suppose it would seem okay to ask him questions or do an investigation, but just whipping him is unjust. Look with me at Luke 23. Luke chapter 23. I want to show you something similar. I don't know if you... Uh, I'm sure you remember the Lord appearing before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate, in the course of those proceedings, clearly concludes that he doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. If you recall, his wife has a vision. She says, have nothing to do with that man. I've suffered greatly in a dream because of him. He asked, you know, the, Pilate asks where the Lord is from. The Lord doesn't answer him. It, it, scripture talks about Pilate being the more afraid. In other words, Pilate clearly realizes, I'm not sure exactly what I'm dealing with here. He then learns the allegation that the Lord claimed to be the Son of God. And rather than laughing about it, he was more afraid. So what, what Pilate decides is he, he decides, look, I don't want to be involved in this at all. And he's looking for a way out. And one of the things he does is he, he perverts the choice and says, well, instead of letting you choose who you want released, I'm going to tell you your choice. The choice is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, or Barabbas. And what he clearly does is he picks out the person in his custody that no one in their right mind would want released, right? He says, I'll give you one of these guys. And what he's hoping is that they'll say, well, you <laughs> you got to be kidding. We don't want Barabbas released. He's a menace. And like, no, no, that's who we want. And so then he's stuck with, how am I going to get out of this pickle? So look at verse 16. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Well, that seems fair. He hasn't done anything wrong that we know of. We can't find anything. How about we just beat him for a while and we call it a day? What you see in Luke 23, 16, what you see in Acts 22, is how human rulers often behave. They behave in ways that are unjust. They beat people and whip people that they have no basis for doing that. But it's just, it's just how human rulers behave. They often deal with things in a way that is unjust. Go back to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Notice verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, what they're doing there is they're tying his hands to expose his back, right? So he's going to be tied, and then they're going to whip him. Look at, look at what happens here. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful? for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned. What's the answer to that question? The answer to that question is no. They can't do that. It's unlawful to scourge a Roman that is uncondemned. Now look with me at Acts 16. In other words, kudos to the Roman system because what the, the rule was, you have to find them guilty before you beat them which is a very reasonable, just rule. Look at Acts 16, verse 37. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Now, if you recall what happened in that passage, they, what happens is Paul's taken into custody, he's whipped, and he's thrown in jail, and they, they, they rush to judgment, and then they realize, oh, wait a minute, he's a Roman citizen. So what the authorities do is they send folks to Paul and say, hey, Paul, um, we're going to just let you go. See you later. Be on your merry way. And Paul says, well, wait, wait a minute. 
you condemned us and beat us publicly, and now you want us to just sort of, you just want to sort of release us in the, in the dark, if you will. To me, what is the equivalent? Here's what we have today that's like that, or it's, it's analogous to that. What the media does all the time is they'll run a false headline on the front page. And then you know what they do? They publish a correction later on page 16. Right? That's unjust. Right? You should do the correction in the same manner and the same prominence and the same visibility as the, the falsehood or the injustice that occurred. Well, what's happening in verse 37 is they just want Paul to sort of slink off quietly. Verse 38, And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. You can see what's going on here. It's clearly a violation of Roman law to beat someone who is uncondemned. And what, what, what's going on is this. The Romans did not care about the rights of non-Romans. So in other words, if you look at those two passages we've looked at, it, it's, a, it's improper to beat a Roman uncondemned. It's not improper to beat someone else uncondemned, is it? So what happens, what Paul routinely deals with in the book of Acts, is he's dealing with governmental authorities that have no idea that he's a Roman. And so what their first instinct to do is, let's just beat these guys. And they beat them. And then in verse 16, or in chapter 16, what happens is Paul says, point of clarification, I'm a Roman. And they realize, we got a problem here. That's one reason why you should always treat everyone fairly, right? Or at the least, you would think they would have like a questionnaire they answer before they proceed to the beatings. Like just to make sure this person isn't a Roman or we'll get ourselves in some hot water. But what that tells you, go back to Acts 22. When the chief captain does this, when he orders Paul to be examined by scourging, he obviously has no, he doesn't, it never entered his mind that Paul was a Roman or he wouldn't have done that. He just assumes that he is dealing with a Jew who is not a Roman citizen. So verse 26, Acts 2, 26. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. So the centurion goes to the chief captain and says, Hey, boss, just FYI, this guy's a Roman, so we need to rethink what we're doing. We're about to get ourselves in hot water. And of course, the danger is there is they violate Roman law and then they're accountable to their superiors for having violated Roman, Roman law. Verse 27. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? You know, maybe you ask that before you start beating him. He said, yay. In other words, yes. So the chief captain avoids narrowly what would have been a big problem for him because he's just hasty and irrational and just frankly unjust. Let's even assume for a minute. Let's assume that Paul wasn't a Roman. Is the right answer in that situation, let's just beat the guy a bunch? It's wrong. It's unjust. It's unfair. Verse 28. And the chief captain answered, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. Here's the great irony in this. The chief captain is a Roman citizen only by purchase. In other words, he was not a Roman citizen and he had to buy that legal standing. Paul was free born. Can you remember what city Paul was born in? Cilicia. So he was born in a Roman city and therefore he apparently had Roman citizenship as a result of that. Verse 29, Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. So they get rid of the people that were going to whip him because they figure out that he's a Roman. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. So the chief captain realizes that the chief captain might have a problem here. And he, he regrets acting rashly. Verse 30, on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty 
wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before him. So verse 30, here's what happens. The chief captain still wants to get the bottom of this. He wants to figure out what's going on. He wants to figure out the truth of the charges against Paul. So what he does is he, has, uh, he, he tells the Jews to bring their chief counsel together, and he's going to send Paul down before them, and Paul will appear before them. And in the process of them questioning him, then he's hopeful that he can get to the, the bottom of this matter. Now, by the way, that's what he should have done in, in the first place, right? He should have investigated uh, before before just proceeding with examining him by scourging. Get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant. Notice this, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death soft, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. So think about what that's saying there. Second Corinthians is written in Acts chapter 20. So in Acts chapter 20, by that point in time, Paul has already been scourged five times, right, where he received... 39 lashings. Verse 23, it says, stripes above measure. I believe what that's saying is this. When you're scourged and and you're whipped like that, the whips, of course, leave leave scars. Well, Paul's back has been scourged so many times that you just can't count them, right? It's just... That's the extent of it. So Paul has the, the, this problem a lot of where he's just whipped unlawfully. So that brings us to Acts chapter 23. Paul's before the council, and we're going to see what the council does. Look at verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. That seems to be a true statement. Um, It it seems that Paul's not bluffing there or making something up, but it it seems to be he's saying something that he believes to be true. Now notice verse 2. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So Ananias believes that Paul is lying. So what does Ananias do? You know, there's a mentality, you know, solve your problems through violence. And that's what Ananias is doing there. In other words, how dare you make that false statement in my presence? And so Ananias instructs for Paul to be hit in the mouth. Verse 3. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Get with me Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. What does it mean here when Paul refers to the high priest as a whited wall? Look at Matthew 23, verse 37, or 23, 27. Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, 
but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So when you think of a, a sepulcher or a tomb, often what happens is they're constructed of, of white stone. They often appear very nice and pleasing to the eye because they're often made of, of nice stone or they're often painted in a way to be white and attractive. But of course, what do they contain? They contain decay. What happens to the human body promptly upon death? It decays. It, 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 you know, it returns to dust and it, it, it corrupts. So what happens in verse 28 is what Paul does is he describes religion as a whited sepulcher. It may have a surface appearance that is positive, but what is its substance? What is it internally? It's corruption, it's decay, it's, it's decadence, it's hypocrisy and iniquity. What most religion does, in fact, I'll say, you know, all religion does this other than what God himself has created. What religion does is it creates a whited, a polished, a, a clean exterior, but internal corruption. So let me say what, let me explain what I'm saying. What religion typically does is it gives you a set of rules. And if you follow those set of rules, you are then declared or perceived to be righteous. This is how you dress. You dress a certain way. And this is the type of vocabulary you use. In this language, you don't. And these are the places we go. And then these are the places we don't. And what it does is it creates a visible appearance that is righteous, but the mere creation of external rules doesn't change the inner man. If I give you a bunch of rules, does that fundamentally change your heart? It doesn't, right? The believer has the exact same sin nature that he always had. The truth is, the sin nature of the believer is really no different than the sin nature of anyone else, right? And what religion does is the different religions, the different denominations, the different sects, S-E-C-T-S, of the world, they all have their own set of rules. And if you follow those rules, then they'll declare you righteous. But all of that stuff can't change the human heart. The only thing that can do that is God the Father. That's why all religion does is it produces whited sepulchers. Because internally, people are just as wicked as they always were. The heart doesn't change. So back to Acts 23. So what, and actually get, get John 7 if you would. Acts 23 and John 7. So when Paul refers to the chief priest as a whited wall... What he's saying is, he's saying, you know, essentially you're one of the religious leaders that is polished. You have this external appearance that seems holy, but is it authentic? And the answer is, it's not. So Paul calls him a whited wall, and then notice what happens next. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, they're going to evaluate Paul according to the Old Testament, and then notice this, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. The chief priest tells one of his officers to, to hit Paul on the mouth, and that act is contrary to the law. Look at John 7, verse 50. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, notice carefully, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth. And the point is it doesn't. The, the, the law doesn't judge someone until it hears him and knows what he does. 
Otherwise, it's just the unjust imposition of punishment before the determination of guilt. What that means, here's what happens all the time. You see this in society today. There'll be an allegation made, and then the talking heads on TV will debate, you know, what's true or what's not true. The rational, sound way to handle that is to not make any determination until the evidence plays out. If you make decisions without hearing both sides, if you make decisions rashly, you're likely to get them wrong. And that's what we've seen multiple times in the scriptures. In fact, in Acts 21 to 23, there are three examples. Let me just list them for you. The first one, the mob wants to kill Paul based upon false accusations. Do you remember in Acts 21, they heard they heard that Paul taught against Jerusalem and he taught against the law and he taught against the people and they wanted to kill him for that reason? Well, that, that charge was completely false. Paul doesn't teach against Jerusalem. In fact, he's traveling there to give them alms, right? He's not teaching against the people. He's trying to give them something. So that was completely wrong. The chief captain wanted to discourage Paul to get to the truth before having determined that Paul did anything wrong. And here, what Ananias does is he commands Paul to be struck on the mouth uh, for, for no reason. It, it, it's, he, it's, it's, it interferes with, with Paul getting a, a proper hearing. Look with me at Leviticus 19 and then Deuteronomy 25. Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19, verse 35. Leviticus 19:35. Ye shall do, notice, no unrighteousness in judgment. So what the Old Testament law provides is that the process of administering judgment should itself be just. It shouldn't be administered unrighteously. Look at verse, or look at Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25, verse one, if there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Now notice verse two, and it shall be if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten. Well, the whole idea of that verse is if he's worthy to be beaten means you had to have a hearing you had to do some investigation and get some evidence before you can conclude that he's worthy to be beaten what we've seen in acts 21 through 23 is a whole bunch of instances where hey look i'm a busy guy i got a lot of things going on it's just much quicker if we proceed to judgment but that, in and of itself, is unjust. It's unfair. It's improper. It's a violation of Roman law. And more importantly, it's a violation of the Old Testament law. I agree. Uh, so we will stop there and then pick up uh, at 11. Lord, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the truths you have written into the book of Acts. Help us to understand them and help us to be the ambassadors you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.